接下来，我要请呃谢文一牧师 John， 他要为我们带来一个简短的专题演讲，有关于 John 的简介，印制在我们的手册当中。他是爱尔兰人，但台湾是他第二个家乡。他目前是伦敦大学的校牧，也是我们所在的这间 m o v e n 教会的长老。他今天要用他的国家爱尔兰以及南非的经验。跟我们分享如何以有益的方式来纪念历史悲剧，并且如何借此来稳固和平与正义。我欢迎赵
It's an individual challenge. And it's a struggle faced by groups of every size, even by whole societies. Especially, it's a challenge for societies that live with the complications and the potential joy of difference. Where different dreams live side by side and jostle for the public space, like passengers on an overcrowded bus. So it's a particular challenge for Ireland, for my country. It's a special challenge for Taiwan too. Where the battle for the present and the future is experienced by all of us as a battle for our memories. And it is difficult, and it is confusing. And so some people of good intention react to the voices that compete to occupy and own our memories by withdrawing and denying. Past is past, they say. They want to forget. They want to forget for two reasons, it seems to me. And neither of these, though, are the best reasons. The first is because they want to escape the pain. And this has led to the experience of not facing what happened, of suppressing memories, but without dealing with the damage that has been done. It's not surprising. One report into conflict in Ireland by a South African peace advocate has the title, All Truth is Bitter. And because this is true, the report goes on to say, Dishonesty has permeated the history of this lovely and tragic land. Truth haunts us all. The same could be said of Formosa, the other beautiful island. There are certain things for all of us. The mere mention or remembering of which is so precious or so painful or so threatening that we are tempted to shut down our capacity for reflection or perspective or understanding. But the danger is that in order to avoid discomfort, we will settle for lies about ourselves and our societies and our country. <coughs> the second reason, the second reason for avoiding remembering is simply impatience. About Ireland, one writer says, of young people in this generation, it is possible to detect an impatience with the conflicts they have inherited, which is wholly understandable. They long either to get away or to ignore what has happened. And we can see this in Taiwan. But no democratic country can be properly served by a forgetful and depoliticized and uninvolved body of citizens for the well-being of our countries and from love of our countries we must not ignore the truth about ourselves and what we have done to one another but we have to go further because to stop here is to uncover pain without offering hope of healing. Memory is the cause of pain. 
but used with imagination and compassion, memory can also be the medicine. For now, it is important to remember. There will be, there will be a time for forgetting. Miroslav Volf, a theologian from Croatia, in the Balkans, writes much about remembering. But he also says that if we are hoping for a time when all things must be whole and true and right, that time with which Christians call the kingdom of God, that must also mean that evil can be undone and unpicked and unraveled. And when that is done, then forgetting becomes the sacred task. In the particular situation of Taiwan, that time is not yet. 1947 is a long time ago, but Taiwanese society is not yet fully healed. The denial and the impossibility of public remembering for 40 years of martial law has compounded the pain and the injustice, and also the shame of those who could not and did not remember their lost. There will be a time to stop remembering these events, and the people of Taiwan will know when that is. That time is not brought forward by calls to move on, get over it. When the time will come, I don't know. But hurry and rush does not help. One thinker says that healing and real change requires a capacity to locate ourselves in an expansive, not a narrow view of time. Another one, more definitely, suggests that to understand ourselves in the context of history, we can engage in a thought experiment. Subtract the birth of the oldest person you have ever known from the life expectancy of the youngest person you have met. And this is your 200 year present. This is your lived history. Remembering calls on us to exercise another indispensable aspect of humanity, and that is imagination. Memory must always be married with a broad and generous imagination. An imagination that sees in history injustice, yes but also accident. Evil intention, yes, but also human mistake. Conspiracy, yes, often, but also recognizing that people act wrongly and then find themselves caught up in the lies and the mistakes and the violence that they began. We know this in our personal lives, don't we? And it's true in the greater matters of massacres and martial law also. We do not lessen or deny the horror or injustice of it when we admit 
that those who perpetrated it also became prisoners. Prisoners of their own lies and propaganda. Afraid because they knew what evil they had done and did not know how to undo it. And so from a small flame of suffering grew a great forest fire to the cost of many innocent lives. It's always the failure of sympathetic imagination that allows injustice and murder and torture and lies to be told so that opponents can be imprisoned or killed. It is sympathetic imagining that heals it. Many of you will know the work by Hu Jiaoyo, Yasia Hu Er, The Orphan of Asia. This novel is a story of a Taiwanese intellectual's life under Japanese rule. The main character is unable to find a happy place, a sense of himself. He's unable to shake off his origins and be truly Japanese when he goes to Japan. He returns to his roots in village life in Taiwan and finds himself a foreigner. He goes to the China of his ancestors and he doesn't belong there either. The Orphan of Asia, written towards the end of the Second World War, is a national allegory. For of course, the orphans of Asia are the people of Taiwan before the arrival of the Gomina. If this is true, if these are truly orphans in spirit, powerless and without father or mother or place in the world in spirit, then how much more terrible is what happened in 228 and after? Nothing is more obscene before God and history than the cruelty of the powerful directed at the powerless. But, but in these very words, yas yada er, we are also invited to remember others, ordinary people too, who found themselves swept along by a history that they did not control. The singer Luo Da Yo used these words, Yasia Di Gu Er, in a song that he wrote and sang to speak of Bumindan soldiers who found themselves and their children forgotten for generations in Burma and Thailand prisoners of a history that left them behind. Asia, even Taiwan, has more than one family of orphans. Finally, there is one more thing. One more thing needed for right remembering. And that is a proper sense of self. Who are the we that are doing the remembering today? Who are the rememberers? Where do we stand? And that is not first and foremost a political question. It's not even a question that can be answered by telling the story of our politics or of our family. It's not even a question that is answered in terms of nation or culture or race. The remembering of 228 does not belong to one person and not another. 
who are we when we remember? That's a question of imagination. It is a spiritual question. And the answer is that we, corporately, regardless of our family history or political view, are the sons and daughters of the soldiers who pulled the triggers. We're the sons and daughters of those unjustly killed. Of those of whom the lies were told so that they could be imprisoned or killed. Of the victims. And we are also the children of the silent, the frightened, and the compromised. We are the sons and daughters of those two. We own them all. All truth is painful, but truth is also what sets us free. Memory can be the motive for violence and conflict, but it's also honest memory when we exercise it with sympathy and a broad 